I will talk about symplectic model reduction for a special case of port Hamiltonian systems here on nonlinear manifold. And the work I'm presenting today is joint work with my two collaborators from Stuttgart, with Patrick Bufink and Bernard Hasel. And so the motivation we're looking at are new sources of energy. And this is a project I worked during my, my postdoc at Cornell. So we have a new uh, need for, for energy sources as we have a growing demand of energy. And as you might know, during the pandemic, that amount actually stagnated. But as soon as the pandemic eased up, this actually got back and it's uh, rising again. We're also running low on conventional energy sources, or we may not even want to use them anymore. And we're looking also for uh, greener alternatives due to the environmental impact we're observing. So global warming and greenhouse gases should be avoided. And one way to actually do this is fusion energy. So some of you may have heard of the so-called tokamak configuration where the eater is built in South France, in Cadarache, which looks like a really giant donut, <coughs> and the other version, which looks like a more twisted donut, and we'll see on the next slide, is the so-called Stellarator, where one of the most famous examples is in Greifswald, and is called W7X. So the process itself we're looking at is the fusion of two isotopes of hydrogen, so here, the deuterium and the tritium, known as heavy water and heavy, heavy water. Those two fused together, we get a helium atom, or also called alpha particle, and we receive energy out of this transition. <coughs> and we have to think back of what we're actually trying to do here. The fusion is the process which powers the sun and the stars, and so we're actually working in a very hot plasma. And so there are the four different states of matter. If we're thinking about a low temperature here and, and just water as a, an example, if it's very cold, we have ice. If we add more temperature to it, we get a liquid. Then more temperature, we get a gas. And we get a plasma if we do heat the gas and then the electron strips free from the nuclei of the atom uh, around it. And then we get a hot ionized plasma. This hot ionized plasma is here in the stellarator configuration inside those blue coils, which are the, the magnetic surfaces, enclosing the plasma, and you're confining the plasma with electromagnetic coils here in blue. And as we're thinking about having it on the sun, bringing it down to Earth, there are some restrictions which we need to capture. The fusion on Earth can only occur if we satisfy a so-called Lawson criteria, which is a triple product of particle density, the temperature, which needs to be very hot, and the confinement time here. And this triple, pro triple product needs to be above a certain threshold. Then we have something which is called turbulent transport, which are instabilities inside the plasma. And those do, of course, um, impact the confinement from here. And in order to get this under control and to optimize for very different parameters for a future device, the successor of ITER, we need to solve uh, kinetic equations, and those are parameter dependent as we want to build the best possible device to actually uh, achieve fusion energy in the future. So what we would like to have, we're in a so-called multi-query setting, and instead of always evaluating the high dimensional model, we want to evaluate a low dimensional model for which the evaluations are a lot faster for each. And the structure of the equations uh, we're looking at are the so-called uh, Blasov, 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 Maxwell equations. So what we do have is a, is a particle density here with which we're starting. And we have here the Blasov equation and it's Blasov, Blasov, of Blasov, Maxwell, if it's coupled to a Poisson equation for the electric field or a Maxwell equation for the electromagnetic. <coughs> and as we can also see, we do have a certain kind of transport structure here. And then there are a couple way, different ways to proceed. 
And the array we're actually looking at is a, a protocol in cell method. So we're taking um, the Dirac uh, masses here, and what we're arriving at is a Hamiltonian system. And as we heard already a couple times before from Benjamin and Jacqueline, it is crucial to actually preserve the structure here also in the reduced model we are having. And so what we also have, we have some works on uh, model reduction for a Hamiltonian system, on pro-Hamiltonian systems as well. And this is more what we're looking at. But we're looking at it in a, some kind of different way. And this is what I will talk about next. So after the slight motivation from the plasma physics side, I will talk about the symplectic model reduction on manifolds, then show our numerical experiment, and then conclude. So the first question is, why are we even looking at the model reduction on manifolds? And the limitation, which Benjamin also mentioned yesterday, is the so-called homograph. And what we are looking at here, if we're having, thinking of this as an element of our high fidelity space, or the big dimension, and here of an element of our reduced dimension, we want to minimize the error. We then look at the worst, best approximation in terms of all parameters here. And then we're looking actually over all these errors of the best uh, linear subspace of dimension n. So what the Kolmogorov NMIF gives us is the best possible error of a linear subspace reduced order model of fixed dimension n. And then what happens, we can actually observe, or has been showed, that there is a slow decay for certain kind of transferred and wave phenomena. So the Kolmogorov NMIF is only decaying with n to the minus one half in both cases. And what we also have to keep in mind that the Kolmogorov ANWIF is actually giving us a lower bound. So we can actually not do better than this. And it also doesn't give us any construction. So it's not even clear if we can achieve this very rate here on the right hand side. <coughs> and so this has been a very recent topic. And I apologize in advance for a not complete list probably here. So there are a couple of ways to overcome this Kolmogorov NWIF. We can update transform linear subspaces or the snapshot itself. Often we need some kind of uh, knowledge about the problem, such as uh, like an <coughs> equation speed or some, some form. We can also cut down our global space and local linear subspaces and see if we get a pr better approximation in each of those one, and then concatenate those together. And what we're looking at is the model reduction on general nonlinear manifolds. And we, in particular, will be looking here at the works of Lee and Kohlberg from 2020. But the challenge we're facing here, so they did it for general nonlinear dynamical systems. And the challenge is, how do we actually do it in order to preserve the, the Hamiltonian structure we do have in the model? And that is the question I will answer in the next couple of slides. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we are starting with a Hamiltonian system here. We do have our Hamiltonian. We have the Poisson matrix with the zero matrix, identity matrix, minus identity, and zero matrix. So we are in a canonical setting here of the, the Hamiltonian. And then we have our time evolution uh, according to the Hamiltonian uh, vector field. And here always the n will denote the big dimension and the small n will denote the small dimension in the following. And thinking back of the classical linear subspace approach, so if we look, we're looking at reduced order models for a linear basis, so what we would have would be a symplectic matrix here our high dimensional state and the low dimensional one. And the idea to perform the model reduction on manifold is actually that we approximate the state we want with not a matrix, but a general nonlinear function here. And this is exactly what Lee and Kohlberg did. 
And this next step, what we're doing here, we're extending this d from a general nonlinear function to a symplectic mapping, which will then guarantee us that also our reduced model will be Hamiltonian. Question is also, I mean, the idea sounds very nice. We are just looking for any kind of d, but how do we actually get this symplectic d, which we're looking for? And the answer is, uh, we're looking here into machine learning, so we're looking into autoencoders. Very brief introduction to autoencoders. We're trying to mimic the input here, having the same on the output side. We're forcing it to have some kind of knowledge representation or knowledge compression in the middle. So we'll here have our latent space in the bottleneck and the function compressing it down as the so-called encoder and the function mapping it back to our high dimensional space is exactly the D we're looking for, which is called the decoder. And in general, the world is also open to use other methods, but what we would use or need for the model reduction is always such a function D mapping from our low dimensional space to the high dimensional space. And the extension to preserve the simplicity here we encoded it as a weakly symplectic deep convolutional autoencoder. So what we're doing, we include the symplecticity pointwise in our um, objective function. And we will see later how this works. And as I said, if we're choosing this D in exactly this fashion, we're getting a reduced Hamiltonian system where we have the Poisson matrix of small dimension here, but we have to have the same structure, still in a canonical setting. And we have a reduced Hamiltonian here, the original Hamiltonian concatenated with our function d. And here on the bottom lines is a derivation of the reduced Hamiltonian system. So we're looking at the reduced evolution of the state and time and we're basically with the chain rule, if we imagine this on the other side, we get the evolution of the reconstructed state we're looking at. And then in those two lines, I imagine some people are screaming in the room. So what I have to mention in this tab, we're actually projecting down our residual. So we have here the residual based approach. We're projecting down our residual here with the symplectic inverse of our Jacobian of the function d we're having. And we assume this residual on the reduced manifold to be zero. And this is exactly what is behind the step here. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the sim. For the, if you have the definition of the symplectic matrix, we have the uh, Jacobian transposed times the high dimensional Poisson matrix times the Jacobian. You assume it to be the small uh, Jacobian matrix. And then the symplectic inverse is basically you multiply the, the small uh, Jacobian uh, Poisson matrix on, on the other side, which is just uh, the transpose. And then you basically, and then you have the, the symplectic inverse. And if you have the symplectic inverse times the uh, matrix itself, you actually get the identity of a small dimension of, of pin. And so what we're using here is the property of the Jacobian being a symplectic matrix here. And again, from this step, we also apply the chain ball, and then we are at our reduced model. And there are a couple of nice uh, preservation results. So we're looking at the, the energy and the stability preservation next. And so, as again, with the x, I always denote the, the full order solution which we get out of our dynamical Hamiltonian system. And we do have deconstructed state here, and I will go back in a minute why we actually chose this particular representation, and why we're not only using the um, mapping from the function from the reduced state here. And one of the points is that we're looking at the error in the Hamiltonian from our high, high fidelity space and our low fidelity space. 
And of course, we want this error to be zero, which is exactly here. And what we can quite immediately show that we can, that actually both of them are, are constant due to the uh, evolution of the Hamiltonian time for the high fidelity and the reduced model. And so we can immediately see that for all parameters and for all times, this needs to be constant. We can actually, in the very next step, show that our Hamiltonian, we have an exact representation due to how we do set our XREF here for our reduced state. And so if we set it to the initial condition with the decoded initial condition on our a low dimensional manifold, and we can do this for all uh, low dimensional initial states, so we can choose this ar even arbitrary here. But as we can see, if we plug in this graph over here, we actually do get the initial solution that we basically have here. So this cancels out with this one here. And we can actually exactly reproduce our initial value. And the initial value from the Hamiltonian due to the preservation in time then actually needs, leads to the exact reproduction of the Hamiltonian here. We also have the, uh, we can show stability preservation. So we're looking at the notion of Lyapunov stability. So basically, if we do have an equil equilibrium point of our dynamical system, and then we have a point which is not too far away from our equilibrium point, it is as Lyapunov stable if we, if we basically, for the evolution in time, this basically still stays close to our um, equilibrium point. And then we can actually show that if we are choosing the Hamiltonian as the so-called Lyapunov function, then we do have an equilibrium point in our high dimensional space. And if we're choosing the reduced equilibrium point exactly in this fashion as we did before, then we can also show that this is our equilibrium point for the reduced Hamiltonian system. And now we're actually at a point where we're thinking about how are we, are we discretizing this. And as we're working with the Hamiltonian systems, we do have the need for a symplectic integrator here to preserve the symplecticity for a long time. And what we're looking at is our uh, implicit s stage wurmke kutta method, as we have an autonomous Hamiltonian. Basically, we don't have the, the time here. But, uh, also, as you all well know, implicit row and crypto methods are not necessarily symplectic, so we need to make sure that we're actually choosing the right one here. So the row and crypto methods are only symplectic if we choose the coefficients here and here according to this equation. And this, for example, holds for the implicit midpoint rule of order two, or also for, for higher order methods, of course. And using this time discretization with the symplectic Runge-Kutta method, we can actually derive an error estimator, which looks pretty full this slide. But what we do need is that our Hamiltonian vector field needs to be Lipschitz. That means we have a, a, a kappa here. And we also need to choose our time step delta t small enough that we actually have a, a matrix T here, which is dependent on the S of the S stage Runge-Kutta. And basically, that this condition is, is invertible. And so what we would do for the implicit midpoint wall for s equal to 1, this would boil down to the time step being smaller than u over the, the Lipschitz constant, which is a quite easy to uh, yeah, satisfy manner. And then we have here an error estimator for each time step for the full order solution to the approximated solution, the reconstructed solution, where we here have the initial state, which is vanishing if we use exactly the initial condition I showed before. And then we have some term on the right-hand side, depending on the residual on the state, as well on the, on the velocity.
And after going through those uh, theoretical results, I would like to show some experiments we're doing here. So we are looking at the a linear 1D wave equation, <laughs> and which is a, a traveling pulse from the left to the right. And the question is, of course, why are we looking at this particular example? And the answer is because we know we exactly observe the slowly uh, decaying Kolmogorov growth NWIF here. So this is a good example to actually see if our method does what we are, uh, what it's supposed to do. Uh, we're discretizing the Hamiltonian, and we end up with a dimension of uh, around 4,000. We're using the implicit midpoint rule as a symplectic integrator with 4,000 steps. And for our parameter, we cut it into eight, take eight discrete parameters out of the, the interval. And so what we in total have are 32,000 snapshots to train our to train our uh, neural network. And so the training and the audio encoder architecture itself, as I said, we do have a data loss here for the, for the data we're getting in from our high dimensional system with a normalizing constant. And we're rating it here with one over alpha and do have a symplectic, uh, the symplectic component here where we try to learn the symplecticity point wise. And in the following slide, I will show a, a couple of different architecture, because what we're actually comparing our method to are first, of course, the, the linear methods, because we want to, to break the school model of N with. And also at the same time, we are comparing ourselves to a, a non-symplectic copy. So we're using the very same parameter as we trained for our weekly symplectic, but we're just setting the alpha to one, so the last term cancels out. And we're also looking at a completely non-symplectic structure for the order encoder, just to see what actually the structure preservation really helps us here. And so we do see a lot of points, and I will guide you through those. Maybe first of all, we're looking at the comparison from the linear subspace methods to the nonlinear subspace methods. And what we do see here in the black dotted line is the POD projection error for two parameters which are not in our training set. So we're seeing how does this perform for parameters which we have not seen before in our training. Then also for the pentagons, those are all the linear methods and we see those are all above the, the black line as expected. And we also see we would probably need a, a lot more going down here that we actually uh, decay. Then for the, um, the pluses are all the, the autoencoders and are all the projection errors of the other encoders we have here. So we can see down here, you know, those are below the black line for the POD projection error we're having. And then what we also see on the <coughs> left hand side for the Galerkin methods, here is our symplectic autoencoder in blue. Then we have the, the symplectic copy. And what decides the, the left-hand side from the right-hand side, we're actually using the manifold lurking here for the time continuous case, projecting it down. For the right-hand side, we are using first the time discrete methods and then projecting down, knowing as the LSPG map. And what we can see, that we basically, for the symplectic method, we get the, the lowest errors here and also the uh, most stable errors in terms of that we have uh, three which stay uh, continuously under 10%, and we also achieve the, the best possible error of uh, 2.3. And many of you might also know that they are here for this purple point, that they are actually either they lie on top of each other or there are a couple of points missing. And what we do observe that if we're looking to the symplectic or non symplectic autoencoders, that actually for the reduced models, we are deriving that we actually have a number of failed runs in our reduced simulations. So basically, it doesn't converge in a fixed number of uh, quasi-Newton solved. And so for all parameters we had, for three parameters with nine different configurations, we have the symplectic manifold galerkin which succeeds for every time. 
for every non-symplectic autoencoder we're using here, we do have at least a third of those non-succeeding. So this is also why we should use the symplectic reduction to see that we still have the Hamiltonians. And as a last result, I will show the symplecticity. So this is for one parameter and only for our configuration to measure how good we actually are. And those lines are increasing by the dimension of the reduced basis. And what we see for, for two here, it actually oscillates a lot. So our thinking for this reason was that basically the dimension of, of two is not enough to actually capture the features of what we need in our reduced model. And then we see where we also had the good reduction errors that we basically have a stable uh, 10 to minus 4 and where our reduction error uh, we increased again we also see that probably this can be due to the uh, less good simplicity we have. And also on the right hand side we have the comparison for all the autoencoders for the Hamiltonian and so for all of those, we preserve the initial condition exactly. And then the question is what happens over the whole time interval. And here for the symplectic autoencoder, we see that we're basically always at an error from 10 to the minus 4 from the beginning to the end. So we're looking at all nine different configurations. This line is the maximum and this other blue line is the minimum we're achieving. And we're doing this also with all the non-symplectic autoencoders where we can see those basically are around one and the best one at the end of the time interval is, is around two. And so let me conclude. So we're looking at the model reduction, symplectic model reduction on the manifolds. I showed that we can build our reduced model that is also Hamiltonian and we do have some nice features as uh, preserving energy and stability, and we can derive an, an error estimator. The extensions we're currently looking at is that we include the symplecticity not in our objective function, but in the general architecture of the outer encoder itself, following the, the idea of the SIMPNATS, and also the extension to the, the port Hamiltonian formulation. And with this, I thank you for your yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for this very nice presentation. We have time for questions. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, so for now, as you've just mentioned again, you're enforcing symplecticity just by including s the symplecticity condition into the loss function, right? Yeah. Um, so um, you've derived some theory bounds for the error um, when using a symplectic method. Yeah. And um, now this will be only symplectic up to some error. So how stable are your error bounds with respect to violating the symplecticity condition? Uh, in this case, we basically, uh, well, let's say we, we use the implicit midpoint rule because in this case it, it works and we didn't need to, to go to higher order. But for, for more different problems, it might be an idea to go to either higher order or uh, probably we, we can talk. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, I was uh, thinking, well, you've got these a priori error bounds, right, mm. that hold independently of how you, uh, which, which, uh, where you actually apply your system to, right? And, um, but they only hold if, if the reduced order model is really 100% symplectic, right? Uh, yeah, but I mean, we're, we're taking the, the error of the, the wrong equator method here into account because the error estimator is basically based on this particular time integration. Okay, so that doesn't actually make use of, of the fact that uh, it's symplectic. These Not error necessarily, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, okay, all right, mm -hmm. so then it holds independently. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. 
So also thank you for the talk and thank you for this question because it answered also my first question. But can you tell a little bit more about the machine on slide number eight? Yeah, so you have this encoder, decoder. So in, in the concrete application to the reduction of the, or the snapshot based reduction of these Hamiltonian systems with these concrete loss functions, how does it work? What is the data? What is the bottleneck? And so I'm pretty new to that. <laughs> Okay, uh, so how is the data? We're taking our high dimensional Hamiltonian system. We want to solve it for, for different parameters. And so we're, we're taking uh, one parameter, we're taking the complete time evolution. And this is one of our, our things. And we're doing this for a couple of different parameters. So we basically have the number of parameters, number of time steps, and here the, the state dimension. This is so the data metric we're giving in, and this is all the, the auto encoder at C. What is in the encoder and what is the bottleneck? And yes, so what we're actually doing, um, we, we do have the, the P, uh, P and the Q, or Q and P in the, in the autoencoder. We, we cut it, we do map it to an interval of, of 0, 1 to actually scale it. We're using a, a convolutional network, which are good to actually recognizing this, this transferred phenomenon. And we are also reducing it down with a, a full connected layer. And then we're actually here at the bottleneck. And the concatenation of those different layers, and I'm also happy to show you more. Uh, if you look at the paper, there's a more detailed picture, picture of this. So this might help. And we can discuss about this later. But this is basically the, the same idea. And then we mirror it for the decoder, which is basically going the same way back. Silke, I have a question. When I was taking a, a machine learning course, uh, I saw that this encoder and decoder were implemented by using convolution uh, new neural networks or something. Mm -hmm. Are you using the same procedure by using this uh, convolution neural network with data, or uh, are you using some different technique? Well, I mean, we're definitely using the convolutional autoencoders here. So I, of course, don't know what you did, but I would assume it's the same. Yes. So did you use some neural yes. So basically, the whole autoencoder here is a, a neural network type, but it's compressing. So for a neural network, you would generally assume you're basically on the on the same dimension here, but with the autoencoder, you really compress it down to this bottleneck, which just then helps here for the model reduction. Yeah. 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 Okay. <coughs> Uh, I'm, are you asking if the auto encodes the, the model reduction? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what? What I showed in the later were basically parameters which were not in the training set. So the autoencoder never saw those parameters. But as a, a general thing for model reduction, if you're too far away from the parameter interval which you're training, you might actually, this is nothing which you can have seen in order to construct a reduced model. So in some cases, if you have a smooth dependence, it might still work or it might just uh, blow off. But that's not what you're trained for. So you always have to be, of course, Careful, which which interval are you choosing? What what are you interesting in? And then, yeah. F further questions? Yeah. Um, the first question that I have: How do you so how do you enforce the symplectic structure? So there are many ways to to parameterize to 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 say that you are on the symplectic manifold, and since it's not a compact manifold, you that's in the same direction as as Christian. Uh, uh, question was it's easily that you divert from it 
with projection errors, mo numerical errors, discretization errors. So uh, how, do you, how do you enforce it? You, you, you're looking for S transpose JS yeah. equ equal to J? Uh, yeah, so for the, um, for the function D, in theory, we, we can show that we're actually on a symplectic submanifold and enforcing it here, we're enforcing it weekly. So, yeah. we're, so that was the idea to go to the um, symplectic build a symplectic auto encoder itself because we, we of course have some discrepancy here. I mean maybe there's a suggestion that you instead go to Lagrange subspaces because they are easier to to enforce. Mm -hmm. This is just a symmetry condition then and not this triple product mm -hmm. which you have to keep which I mean that's the experience that we have with symplecticity in eigenvalue methods where it's always diverting mm -hmm. In, in the iteration very quickly uh, from simplicity. That, that was the first question. And the second question that, that I have is <coughs> how much do you actually gain? So this example that you took, the 1, 1D wave equation, is a wonderful example where you can do is one function if you sit yourself on the wave. Um, and, and in principle, you should be able to somehow identify the wave rather than the simplicity. So is, is, can, can you see how much you, you gain from, from just using arbitrary model reduction, which doesn't work due to Kolmogorov, and then uh, simplicity, or if you would sit yourself on the wave and, uh, and use directly uh, sorry, something like shifted pot, because that would be a better reference than pot, which is bad. <laughs> For so, but then we would be, well, then we would be also in the, in the first setting that we have some prior knowledge about the, yeah. the, wave, the wave itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be interesting, and we didn't compare it to this yeah. until be now. Because, because for the reference, to use pod as a reference is maybe not a good good reference because pod is not yeah, doing I think very that's well. <laughs> I think that's what everyone using and it would be it, in general it would be very interesting to have these three different approaches which are all breaking the Kolmogorov and with and compare those to each other. Yeah, and in particular and then put the deep neural net, the, the uh, yeah. training on, on this would be good because there is an open problem how do you choose a shift in shifted pod. And that okay. may be done yeah. with the... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm so close you can... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking from, a, from the other side. If you, if you see that I have an infinite dimensional system and you can approximate it very well with a uh, finite dimensional nonlinear system, mm -hmm. then my claim is somehow that we can embed every nonlinear OBE into an infinite dimensional linear system. Kupman. <coughs> because it's, it mm -hmm. must be somehow, because otherwise you cannot approximate, yeah? Yeah, that's a... Ah, that's a Kupman, okay, good. <laughs> no, I, I thought about it when I was a student, so I never came to that. Okay, so let's take one more question and then we go to the coffee break. Okay, thank you for a very nice uh, talk. Um, I was just wondering if you have considered, uh, I, I mean, I, in, in practical situations, Hamiltonian systems often have more structure, like they can be separable, for instance, which is very, very common in, um, in mechanics. Uh, you can have symmetries uh, and uh, there can be uh, momentum maps and things like that. Uh, is that something you have thought about how to include in your, uh, in your approach uh, to preserve also those uh, uh, kind of properties at the same time? Yeah, first of all, the, so this is the, the first work in this direction, so we're also looking at the simplicity in particular right now, but we're planning it to extend it also to, to other conserve or have other structures. Uh, because just to add one small thing is that uh, with, a se for instance, separable Hamiltonian systems, your, uh, your uh, methods are, of course, also much less expensive. And if that could be taken advantage of, maybe that would be a good, good thing to start with if you want to generalize something. Mm. Okay. I'm happy to talk to you later. Well then, let's thank Thuke for this very nice presentation and <laughs> see you later.